sometimes, I guess, inquiries may have an IA number and at other times they may not.
will call to order the meeting of the Twin Falls City Council for, hold on, we get the date, Monday, September 19th. It is 3.30. Uh, we currently have five members of the council here. We are going to recess to uh, head out to the airport to tour the construction projects that are underway there. And it is my understanding that Councilman Lanting will be meeting us there and perhaps Councilman Hall as well. But we will uh, come back here uh, by 5 o'clock for the continuation of our meeting. And with that, we will stand in recess. Sure, and regular agenda now. So to start, for those of you wishing to join me, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> We do have a quorum of the City Council here. All seven members uh, are here this evening. Mr. Rothweiler, do we have any amendments to our agenda? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, there are no amendments this evening. Thank you. We have no proclamations. So the next item is uh, general public input. And I have uh, Lee Stranahan, who has signed up to address the Council. Uh, again, we will limit the time to three minutes this evening uh, to address the Council on an issue of pertinence to uh, the City and uh, go from there. So, Mr. Shanahan, welcome. If you'd please uh, state your name and address for the record. Yeah, sure, uh, sure, Mr. Mayor. Uh, hello, Mr. Mayor, and hello to the City Council. My name is Lee Shanahan. I'm a resident of Twin Falls. Um, and uh, I was at the economic development meeting uh, that happened last week, and I thought I would just make a couple of general notes in the, in the public record about that. Uh, it was, a, I thought, a very good meeting, and um, I thought it was significant uh, for a couple of, of reasons. I thought that the goals that were laid out, especially the recognition of the fact, and I thought uh, Mr. Rothwell did a very good job on, uh, on his presentation about this, the goals that were laid out at that meeting, for instance, uh, bringing more young people into town and retaining the young people who are here, that kind of thing were, were great goals. Um, I wanted to talk about one thing that I noticed, just to sort of put the thought in your head a little bit. There was a good deal of talk about the downtown development, and I thought that was also good and very interesting. But I think the thing that was missing from that, and this isn't really a criticism because it, it wasn't there, maybe it's being discussed more, but was I, I think the one thing that's going to help the downtown is to have some anchor businesses down there. Right now, I think part of the problem with downtown is that there simply aren't businesses that are going to be magnets to attract people there. So a lot of development that's going on, for instance, with the, with the new park going on, the sewer development that's going to be happening on Main Ave, those, those are all great. And even the City Hall, which, the, the, uh, again, Mr. Rothweiler did a good job of explaining the way the City Hall is going to look. That's all great. However, very few people are going to grab the wife and kids and head down to the City Hall. And I think that's the sort of thing that needs to be talked about. I, I spoke to a couple of people from the city about that. And it's obviously not the kind of thing that the city council can mandate, but it is the kind of thing that I think a little bit of thought needs to be put into. So again, I wanted to thank everybody for, for that meeting. Uh, I, th I thought it was very, very interesting, and I just wanted to put that idea in your head. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Shanahan. <clears throat> so that is uh, all the folks that I had signed up to address the council this evening. I do have uh, uh, another gentleman who's on the agenda in a little bit, Mr. Herring. Uh, so is there anyone else who uh, just arrived that uh, would like to address the, the council? Seeing none, we will move on with the agenda to the consent calendar. Council wishes. Suzanne Hawkins. I move approval of the consent calendar. Three. A motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Greg Lanting, to approve the consent calendar. Is there any discussion from the council? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Sean Berger. Yes. Chris Hawkington. Yes. Greg Lanting. Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Motion passes 720. Uh, under items for considera consideration, the first is a uh, request to confirm the reappointment of Brady Workman for a second term on the Airport Advisory Board. So uh, Brady was appointed to the Airport Board uh, in 2013, and over the first three years of his first term, he's attended the meetings regularly, been a very positive contributor. 
Uh, City Code 8-7-3 says the airport board members are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council. Uh, I've uh, visited with uh, Bill Carberry, also with Councilman Talkington, who's the liaison to the airport board, and uh, would like to uh, request that the council confirm my reappointment of Brady to serve a second three-year term on the airport advisory board. And Brady is here and I suppose could answer any questions if anyone has any for him. Let the do it. Oh, well, I was just going to do a second, but I so move. Second. Heartily. So. I have a motion by Chris Talkington, seconded by Greg Lanting, to uh, confirm the reappointment of Brady Workman for a second term on the airport advisory board. Is there any discussion from the council? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Absolutely, yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. to zero. Brady, would you like to come forward and tell us about your level of enthusiasm for <laughs> yet another three years of serving on the airport board? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's actually been very exciting the last three years. I'm lucky enough that I came on as a lot of the paperwork process was just finishing with the new terminal expansion that you uh, got a tour and some other growth that's happened at the airport. So I'm lucky to have been taking part in that. And as it continues to go over the next three years, we've got great airport and great staff, so happy to be out there. Thank you again, Brady. We appreciate your service, and you've done an excellent job. We look forward to another term with you. Next on the agenda is a request from Alfred Herring to waive the non-conforming building expansion permit process for a home located at 412 Blue Lakes Boulevard. Mr. Herring is here, and we have uh, Jonathan Spendlove from staff to share with, the, share with us the information. We knew that with Mitch gone, it would be <laughs> difficult for everyone to figure out how to run the That's overhead. So I'll just start into it, and we can talk about get the uh, maps up there in just a minute. Uh, background. It's a request from Alfred Heron who's asked to allow to uh, build an addition on the front of his residence located at 412 Blue Lakes Boulevard. It's in the R4 zoning district. The minimum front yard for that zone is 20 feet from the property line or 80 feet from the street center line, whichever is greater. So Blue Lakes Boulevard being a somewhat major roadway is a rather large center line setback. That would actually be for future right-of-way acquisition if we needed to expand the roadway in the future. So now that we're up, I can give that back. Jonathan, is that microphone on? Should be on. Is it on? Yeah. It is. I I have to it speak kind of close I to, to it. About it. It's, okay. it's a little quiet. So the colors we're looking at, we have a, the Blue Lakes Boulevard would be on the left. It's identified with, um, with letters. And then we have a right-of-way, which is the actual right-of-way owned by ITD. And then we have an 80-foot center line setback. And that's got a... It's, kind of a purplish, dark reddish dotted line it, pretty much down the middle of the house. Um, yeah, right there. Uh, we had a request for a deck to be added onto the back, which would be the northeast corner of the house. Uh, we had a permit for that, and that was approved and finished. Uh, during that, uh, some inspections on that, we noticed that the front of the house, and we had some discussions with Mr. Heron before we kind of went through that building permit process, there's a small orange box that is up on the front of that. That shows the expansion of a what is a front deck and a covered porch. Uh, when you do that, it requires a building permit. You're essentially expanding the front of your house into that setback. That's what we have. It's a non-conforming building due to it being within that centerline setback. So the whole house is non-conforming, along with a bunch of the houses on Blue Lakes Boulevard. A lot of them are that way. Uh, but we also have this um, addition that, which has been built without a building permit. Um, so that's kind of where we are today. Uh, once we figured out it was already built, we tried to figure out the legal ramifications of what we would do and how we would proceed. So what we would do is proceed to the city council to act on a waiver. Uh, typically, you do not see these waivers that add on to the front of houses. Uh, staff is not supportive of that due to future roadway acquisition. We don't want to have a similar situation or a worse situation than we had on Washington. We tried to expand that. We're really close to people's houses. Uh, so we don't typically bring these because we don't uh, support them at a staff level. 
However, we have what we have here. So the uh, council is tasked with making a decision on waiving this non-conforming building expansion, or if it's not waived, there is another way going through the actual public hearing process through the Planning and Zoning Commission. They would make a decision, um, which could be either um, it'd be a final if it's a yes or no, or it could be appealed to you as a body for a, uh, an expansion as well. So that's kind of the history and what we're here for in the nutshell. If there's any questions, I can certainly ask any, and if Mr. Heron's in the audience, we'd have answers from him. That's all I have. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Don Hall. Jonathan, do you know when this took place, the actual addition? We know the, uh, the deck took place this summer through the building permit processes. The actual addition onto it, I don't have an exact date. Does I Mr. Do Herring know that? It he, he is here. Is Mr. Herring in the audience? All right. Yep. Right. Mr. Herring, could you? Well. Okay. I might repeat him because I didn't hear what he had to say. My, my question to you, Mr. That's not a new uh, picture, obviously. I have a new metal roof, and that's why we're here, because I've really upgraded the property. Um, I was told that my porch had to be 32 feet from the center line. It's, uh, it had to be 20 feet. It's 32. But I was told my house had to be 50. I don't know what size porch people are building, but that was odd to me. And also, I wanted to go on record that I was told that I didn't qualify to meet the city council on this. So they tried to keep me from coming in. But um, the point I would like to make is that the overhang saves me on electricity. I don't have to run my air conditioner all day. It keeps my house cool. And the only reason why I don't meet the requirement is because my house isn't 50 feet from the road. But nobody's house that was built in 1920 is 50 feet from the road. My house was there first. You guys built the road too close to me. My house isn't close to the road. But um, the other weird thing is, is that I would rather be approved and meet city building codes, even though it's going to cost me money, than not be approved, because the only way to make it legal is to make it a freestanding, disconnect it from the house, disconnect it from the porch, put four by fours in the ground on the side of it, and then it's legal doesn't make any sense to me because I'd rather it be safe. Mr. Herring, could I ask you a couple questions? Yeah, of course. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. When did you do the addition on the front? That, uh, well, the overhang um, was just about three months ago, three okay. and a half months ago. Were you, were you aware that you needed a building permit to do that? No. Okay. That's why, I, but then... When I, you know, when I was going through all the process, because we wanted to build a balcony on the back, which they approved, and it's finally been written off, um, I found out I needed a building code for this, too. I mean, a permit. So right. I'd rather be, like I said, I'd rather be legal, and I'd rather it be attached to the house. Because strangely enough, if I, I detach it from the house and make it a freestanding unit, it's legal. It's just not as safe. So you just weren't aware that you needed a building permit when you Not put the front? Not for an overhang for an existing porch, no. Okay. That was my question. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. You bet. Greg Lanting. Jonathan, uh, trying to look at the picture here, okay? And I know we're dealing with the, uh, you said orange. I'm not sure I see that as orange, that area right there. Right. Why does it look to be that the other part of the roof was already there. So that's kind of, it's the angle of the aerial picture as you're taking it with the shadow. Um, it's because the plane's like. Okay, so that above, used. that little dark in arrow, yeah. that, go right above that. Right near. You know, no, go above it. Dark. Right there, that looks like it was already there previously. So that's part of the main roof. And that okay. roof is just in line with the building. It just looks like it's not. Oh, I see. So that's really in oh, line I with see. the front. You draw a line between the. It's a shadow. I see what you're saying. The backside of it. It's, okay. It, All right. It's extending. So that's the extension out over the, the new deck. Yeah, area. it's just there's a, there's a small eave, but the the front building line is still right. It's right there. Yeah. Thank you, Chris Talkington. Well, I uh, encouraged Al, Mr. Heron, to um, seek the non-conforming building expansion permit. <laughs> if you've driven in that area you'll notice that his house is one of the nicer looking ones on the block of an area that does not always have well taken care of homes, let alone upgrades. There's a vacant field to the south that's a detriment, but well within the building line of 50 feet or so. 
Uh, I think we should give very strong consideration to granting this to encourage people, albeit to work within the code, which Al admits that he didn't know until he asked me, uh, to consider uh, putting money into their homes and upgrading a, a part of the town that's too easily uh, doesn't have money put back into it. I'm, I'm a very strong supporter of the request. Suzanne Hawkins. Jonathan, I have two questions. So explain to me what the applicant's talking about, that if it was freestanding, it's legal, and if it's attached to the house, it's not. It's getting into some building codes, and I'm not the building official. So I'm not going to get into okay. the, what the building department may have told him as far as what could be legal and what's not legal as far as needing a building permit. And I don't know if they're here. didn't think they would, we would get into the building code sections, but I can certainly get some answers a different day if you guys really need those. Um, Sorry, I can't really give that answer. Okay. And where I appreciate him trying to upgrade his house, I think it's important that we um, don't set the wrong example for other people that if you build it, they'll forgive it and let you have it, which worries me in this case, to be honest. And um, I'm, I, I'm trying to find out. So if we decide that this is not okay tonight and it goes to planning and zoning and they decide it's not okay, what, what does that mean? You would, it could be um, appealed by the applicant back to you. But it, what, what you're talking about tonight is just a waiver of the process. Okay. Um, it could go through the full public hearing process um, if you decide not to vote for it. Um, the option for Mr. Herman would be to go through the full uh, non conforming building expansion process, which is public hearing with Planning and Zoning Commission. Any decision they make is appealable to the City Council. So at that time, if it's decided that this was not in the best interest of the city, what would happen to his front porch? You mean if the final decision by the city council was to not approve it? Mm -hmm. Would I let Fritz answer that question? Mm -hmm. I think I will. We can remove it, I guess. Uh, if he did not voluntarily take it down, we could take legal action against him uh, requiring uh, getting an, an order from the court requiring them to remove it. So that's not a very pretty picture. No. So I, I know this is tough, but, you know, we don't want people just to start building on and then coming to us on the hindsight like that. So how do, how do we prevent this? How do we prevent from being put in this position to approve something that's against our own city code? It's not. It's not against your code. You have the right to to waive the process and to to grant it. Uh, so that's the request is not against the code. The question is whether you want, as Chris argued, uh, improvements to the real estate in the area, or on the other hand, whether you need to protect the public right of way for future widenings. So if the state comes through and wants to widen this road, what does that do to his front porch? Then is that between them and him, or do, uh, are we still so in the middle? It, that's the problem. So it, it may affect the damages to be paid to him. If, if it's been approved, then you're paying for the – ITD is paying for the porch in addition to the damage to the house. Thank you. Greg. Excuse my mind. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions from the council? Nikki Boyd. Jonathan, um, he put a balcony on the back of his house, and he knew, um, and it was known that he needed a building permit, but he did not have to go to planning and zoning to do that. He didn't go to planning and zoning to do that. He didn't. He did not go to the planning and zoning commission for it. He came to us for that, and... A permit was issued for that prior to the knowledge of the building department knowing he needed to go to either get a waiver from the council or go through the process. I'm not talking about the front for porch. For the balcony, I'm, that's correct. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how somebody can go in to get a permit and not realize that they can, that they go before planning and zoning or how there were two projects on the same house, yes. and and we have this discrepancy. I'm, yes, I'm having yeah. a hard time. We have two projects on the on the building. We have a, we have a balcony on the back, right. which required a building permit. It came to the building department to get one. That was issued during the review of that process. Basically, reviewing the process and what happened, it was found out that the building department issued a permit for the balcony. 
On the back. The back. The back deck. I think we call it the deck now. Right. Okay. At that time, we talked with the building official. We had already issued the permit. Some work had already been conducted. We did not make him go to planning and zoning or to you for a waiver for that piece of, for the deck on the back. Because he came forward and got a permit. He should have gotten one anyway, we, but we, that was a. But the process was, I, I'm concerned yeah. is because he, um, when he came up and spoke, he, he wasn't clear on that he, he was going to come before planning and zoning. Yeah, so we had a lot of discussion on whether or not this front part or any part of his house should go through a waiver process or the full process. The problem we have is we don't bring ones on the fronts of houses that basically are encroaching mm -hmm. further to this waiver process. We just we feel they should go through the normal one, which is a full hearing process. Starting with planning and zoning. Right. After finding out that it was already built, it took us some time to figure out, kind of Fritz explained, what our legal ramifications were and how far we would have to go before bringing it to you. Thank you. Hopefully that answers us. It's a bit. Yeah, better. Yeah. Okay. Chris Dawkins. Well, if I were a betting man, I'd even give odds that the state ITD will never widen Blue Lakes in that area. I think it's a case where... <clears throat> um, a situation like this where a person takes money out of their own pocket to improve the front um, elevation of their home are so rare and so few in between that this is not a deluge of, of people trying to slide underneath a, a city rule. I think we're faced with a question of waiving the non-conforming building expansion permit in the name of beautifying and increasing the value of a home or sticking uh, to a code that is uh, allowing us to do this because of its flexibility. Uh, as such, I, I move to waive the non-conforming building expansion permit for the uh, home located at 412 Blue Lakes Boulevard. Second. A motion by Chris Toggenton, seconded by Don Hall to waive the non-conforming building expansion permit. So I, I need a clarification maybe from Jonathan. To, are, are we waiving the process or the permit? It's basically you're waiving the process, but it's the same. It'd be the same. Okay. Don Hall. You know, I'm really not keen, Mr. Herring, on um, allowing people to ask for forgiveness rather than permission, but I believe you that you didn't know that you needed a building permit on the front. And, and so I'm going to be in support of this waiver for you. Um, again, I'm not a believer in that we should, uh, you know, beg for forgiveness is easier than getting permission kind of thing. So, but on, on this case, again, I, I believe you and I think uh, you're trying to do the right thing here. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. I agree with you, Don. I do believe him also, but I don't think um, waiving the process is the right choice in this one. I think the right thing to do is send it back through planning and zoning and let them go ahead and have their say. That's what they're there for, and then see where it goes from there. So I will not be supporting the motion tonight. Nikki Boyd. I also appreciate people who invest in their own homes and who um, one of the things that you did was because it you didn't need as much air conditioning. It keeps your house cooler. And and I, I, I wish it had gone through all the proper channels, but in this case, I am, I am going to support that. We, we waive this. <clears throat> Jonathan, can you tell me how much further into the right of way this encroaches, the addition? I can give you an approximate since I don't have an Is it about one. six feet is what I'm... Plus thinking. or minus six? Well, it was four and a half. This is a picture of the front porch. Um, I'm guessing it's it's between six, four to six feet. Okay. That would encroach into further into the, the, setback, the setback, not the right-of-way. It's not actual right-of-way. It's just future right-of-way that right. would reference that. Thank you. Uh, Greg Lanting. Well, this, uh, Mr. Is it Herring? Herring. Herring. Herring, this is a hard one for me as well. I think I'll probably be voting in favor of this process. I can see why the staff was wanting you to go through the other process because we typically see these 
and the people have just built on the back or built on the side. They haven't come any farther into the into the setback. Uh, but this picture helped me to say yes, I will be voting for it because it's. I don't know how much more that that will add to the value should the, we ever have to widen that street or the state that chooses to widen that street. I would like to see that street widened, but I'm not sure there's room to widen it, to be, to be honest with you. So I will be doing a favor, but I'm not, because of the way it looks like, if you'd build a whole addition out this way, I'd probably be with the staff and saying maybe it's time to tear this down and start over. But it, where it's just a porch has a different feel to me. <clears throat> Any further discussion from the council? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Sean Berger. Yes. Chris Talkington. Yes. Greg Lanting. Yes. Don Hall. Yes. Ruth Pierce. Yes. Suzanne Hawkins. No. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Motion passes 6 to 1. Mr. Mayor. Yes. So in listening to the presentation, it sounds like that there was some confusion that was uh, part of the staff's process. And so we'll, we'll have a conversation internally and look what we can do to shore that up as well. All right. Thank you, Travis. <clears throat> Next on the agenda is a request to approve an airport utility plan update contract with JUB engineers in the amount of $30,000 and to authorize the mayor to sign the agreement. We have Bill Carberry, our airport manager. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. Um, this is a fairly recent Google image. Uh, it shows uh, really the footings for FedEx there, so it'll be, it'll be good for our discussion today. Um, in our budget, the airport budget this year, uh, we have $30,000 budgeted for an airport utility master plan update. The last one was done in, in 2007, and it's, it's certainly time for an update. One of the reasons we really we've waited to initiate this project is, is because there's a lot of things uh, starting to happen uh, in the northeast uh, development area. With the, uh, with the addition of FedEx uh, that, that, that came about, um, it's really changed um, the landscape there. Um, so. Um, we're tying the utility plan update uh, in conjunction with a couple of other projects that I'll be coming to you in early October to discuss. One is this is our main parallel taxiway, alpha taxiway, that goes out to the runway, which would be down in this area. So this is in need of rehabilitation. It's been several years since we rehabilitated that. Um, what? Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. All right. Who did that? Don't push that button again. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Not a good one, but. So, as I was saying, so what we want to do is incorporate this rehabilitation project to identify an area somewhere about here to work with a, a preliminary design project, which I'll also be bringing to you in October, that will look at the pre-design for a new taxi lane to come here as we develop our neighborhood out here. So those two will be coming, the, the taxiway project I'll be bringing to you in October, as well as this pre-design, which will have a lot of public input involved with it, a series of meetings, to really determine how do we um, facilitate this area for future hangar development, aeronautical development, and the ability to access um, the taxiway and then the runway. So taxiway, pre-design here will be coming. But backing up to utility plan, that really folds right in. Um, as we're working on these projects, and starting to determine what our neighborhood's going to look like here and how we'll access it and where future development parcels will lie. How uh, We need to look at where are our utility corridors. You know, that will come after we inventory. What do we have out there? What are our capacities? Those kinds of things. The FAA is a great partner, and they give us a lot of money for capital improvements. But one thing that they draw the line on are utilities. When it comes to utility improvements, which really are what key development is really what ties things together, you're pretty much on your own as an airport operator, sponsor, city and county and airport, to try to fund those utility improvements. So hence the utility plan study is in our budget made up of city and county support. So with that, we really share hats with developers. People come along, they want to 
uh, develop something aeronautically at the airport. They wear a hat of a developer, but yet we do too. So it's a little bit of a different relationship out at the airport than we would have maybe in town. So with that, uh, I've done a lot of chattering here. Um, I'd like to uh, answer any questions you have about it um, and uh, seek your approval and uh, the mayor's uh, signature for the contract. Any questions for Bill? <coughs> Chris Doggins. Bill, I just wanted to, didn't have a chance to talk with you out at the airport, but uh, this Thursday I'm meeting with the head of Intermountain Gas about uh, that line to go out there, so I'll let you know if there's some hopeful language out of that. Thank you. Yeah, natural uh, gas to the to the airport is something we hope to incorporate in, in the future and uh, figure out how we might possibly do that. We'll be also inventorying um, uh, fiber optic. Uh, communications to the airport to support uh, airport operations and data. That's something that we'd really like to develop in the future as well um, to complement um, growth out there and future development. Any other questions or comments for Bill? Nikki Boyd. Ready for a motion? I am. Uh, I move that we approve the consideration of an airport utility plan update contract with JUB engineers in the amount of $30,000. I'll second that. Motion by Nikki Boyd, seconded by Ruth Pierce to approve the airport utility plan update contract. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. Two quick questions. Is this already in our budgeted items so it's been pushed through the right places? It is in the budget and we're looking to encumber those funds. and move through this study uh, through the better part of 17, halfway through or so. Okay. And this is a 50-50 split with the county, I'm assuming? Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> Any further discussion? Do we need to add that uh, have we, to allow you to sign it? I just understood. Do we need that language in there? Okay. It's understood. Sharon, roll call vote, please. <laughs> Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Barriker? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next is a request to authorize the mayor to sign a letter requesting ITD participation in the consideration of improvement to the traffic flow through the Blue Lakes Boulevard and Fillmore Bridgeview intersection. We have our city engineer, Jackie Fields. Welcome, Jackie. Hello. Um, this evening, I'm here to talk about having the council authorize the mayor to sign a letter. Um, recently, there's been a tremendous amount of development west of Blue Lakes um, near the Fillmore and Bridgeview intersection. And as that development has occurred, um, staff has noticed and citizens are noticing and talking to us about. It's not very loud so tonight. Sorry. Well, you know, it'll be okay. So um, people have been commenting to staff, and we've been um, attempting to uh, try to make improvements to the flow of con traffic through that intersection. Um, when you stand there for an, a period of time, it appears that um, people are not comfortable entering the intersection from the Fillmore side primarily, although it happens a little bit on the Bridgeview side, and it might just be the width of the intersection because it is, you know, the largest intersection most of us have seen in a long time. Um, we we would like to engage ITD in a conversation that results in improved traffic flow on the side streets without necessarily. Um, negatively impacting the, the state highway. And um, we felt that a letter from the council supporting that request would provide a little bit of traction so that we can move on and go forward because um, our level of comment from the public is increasing um, regularly and not quite dramatically, but you know it's, it's time that we have that conversation. So um, this letter will identify this intersection, the intersection of Blue Lakes with Fillmore and Bridgeview as a priority for the city. And we'll ask ITD to participate in helping us evaluate the intersection so that all of our needs can be met. Greg Lanting. 
Well, Jackie, I really appreciate that we're trying to, you know, at least get a dialogue going with them. I, I have come out there on Fillmore numerous times needing to turn left onto Blue Lakes and head over the bridge. And I don't know whether it's the size or the fact that any intersection I've ever been into in my life that that's big has a turn arrow. And I know that the state may be balking on a turn arrow because they don't want to back up traffic on the Blue Lakes. But I think that's the issue to me is that without a turn arrow, you're not sure, are they coming at me? Can I turn? I've seen numerous people turn and turn right into the traffic because they're just so used to a turn arrow on that big of an intersection, that busy of an intersection. We've, we've trained them to use turn arrows and then we take one away or we don't have one. And so uh, we take it away, it just is, never existed. So I think to me that is one of the issues we need to discuss with them because without a turn arrow, you're not sure what to do. You know, you turn up there, like, are they going to come? Because they don't always start right away. And, and then, so yeah, I've been confused myself, and I know that they're going to come, but you're just surprised that they aren't coming right away. And so you, you feel like you're in no man's land at some point. Chris Hawkins. Uh, Jackie, if we do, um, or when we give you this letter, uh, that just gets us on a list for reconsideration that, First, the state has to decide whether to consider it and then to put us on a priority list, and it may be years before anything would come of this. But this is a, a first step. This is a first step, and I don't believe that this step would, um, at this point, result in trying to get onto the, onto the ITIP or their, their large capital improvement um, list. It, it may be analysis and, and very modest investment to make a change there uh, but I don't know that you know um, it may turn out that the analysis of that intersection ends up having some rather large financial impact and then we need to plan the work out in the future I uh, would like to think it's as simple as putting on a signal head but um, that the traffic flow in that area is not particularly simple so it may be a little more complicated than that. Nikki Boyd Two things. The first one is I, I very much think it's it's a signaling thing, and I, I've brought before this body before that we have two different kinds of, of um, lights. So we have the doghouse, and, and, and then it says, you know, you can go on, you know, it's okay to go if it's on green. We have two different kinds, and so some of the people who um, are, are not from around here are ha – it's been a problem, and so I found out that over the course of the next two or three years, we're in the course of replacing all of those, so they'll all be the same. And I think this intersection is the same thing. When it was new, I, I, I looked at that arrow for quite a long time, deciding if those people were going to come at me or if, or if I could turn, and was I supposed to hit the gas harder to beat them? So uh, that's going to help, but I'm just wondering if – the real crux of it is when you're turning, say you're coming south on the bridge and you're turning over to, to go to Best Buy or the mall or something, there's three lane choices and and people are just stopping and deciding where they're going to turn. And Did that need to be bigger from the get-go or I don't know, but it just seems like it, there's a bottleneck there. On Bridgeview? Mm -hmm. When you turn on to Bridgeview, that seems to be a real regular... To the point where I think a lot of people are just going down to falls and then coming back around because they don't want to deal with that. But, and what is the accident count there? Do we do we have a problem with that? We have some accidents in that area. So Mike and I did a quick review of the accidents that were there um, for a somewhat different reason, and uh, they are thankfully. Uh, not fatal and um, not uh, in the class that are um, serious injury and but they are property damage okay thank you you bet so did you get hit or did no Suzanne Hawkins thank you Jackie thank you for working on this I know it's an issue that we really need to address and I appreciate you taking time to do that um, I wonder if some of the problem might not also be some of that brickwork there so the lines aren't real 
easy for people to tell where they're at, where they're going, and who's coming and going in what directions. And I know the brick's a pretty entrance, but it that might be somewhat deceiving to people, too, on which direction they're heading and maybe some different striping or something, even if we can't get ITD to help with that. I don't know. Just a thought. I don't see any, I don't see any further discussion. So, Chris Dockington. Move to authorize the mayor to sign the letter to ITD uh, requesting participation in uh, the uh, traffic flow uh, improvements at Blue Lakes and Fillmore and Bridgeview. Second. Motion by Chris Stockington, seconded by Suzanne Hawkins to authorize the mayor to sign the letter. Any further discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, share and roll call vote, please. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriker? Yes. Chris Talking? Yes. And passes seven to zero. Good and, luck. And Jackie is next on the agenda as well with a request to approve the request for proposal preferred list and authorize staff to enter into negotiations with Civil Science Incorporated for the transportation master plan. Jackie Fields. Okay, so I'll be brief in the, the background here. So we made a decision to use the RFP process to seek a consultant for the transportation master plan. We developed a team, we evaluated the proposals, um, the requirements of the law are that we rank uh, these firms um, based on the criteria that we gave them um, when they actually submitted for a proposal. Um, and so we did that. And the firms, um, you know, it was, uh, there were two that were very close, and so we asked some supplemental questions, and uh, the team felt comfortable with uh, the list as um, developed. And it is Civil Science, Kittleson, JEB, and Rita Soul Engineers. So we've developed a list, and the request this evening is to approve this list and allow staff to enter into negotiations with Civil Science to develop the scope for the Transportation Master Plan. Any questions or comments for Jackie? Suzanne? I move that we approve the list and authorize staff to enter into negotiations with civil science for the transportation master plan. I'll second that. A motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Ruth Pierce, to uh, approve the request, uh, the preferred list, and authorize staff to enter into negotiations with civil science. So I will say I, I helped to participate in the review of these, and um, they were very tight, um, but uh, the, the input was uh, really positive from, uh, from the firms, and uh, the supplemental questions, I think, are really going to help us get to a plan that addresses not only the technical uh, needs, but really um, provides an opportunity for some good public participation and some good communication with the community um, and, and gets us all to the place we need to be at the end of it. So thank you for the opportunity to be a part of it, Jackie. You bet. Seeing no other uh, discussion, share and roll call vote, please. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanty? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. <clears throat> Next on the agenda is uh, items from the city manager of the city council. Mr. Rothweiler, do you have any items for us? You do not. Any members of the council have any items of general interest for us? We are just sailing through here tonight. So next on the agenda, we have uh, adjournment to an executive session under Idaho Code 74206-1A to consider hiring a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent wherein the respective qualities of individuals are to be evaluated in order to fill a particular vacancy or need. This paragraph does not apply to filling a vacancy in an elective office or deliberations about staffing needs in general. Um, 74206-1B, to consider the evaluation, dismissal, or disciplining of, or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent, or a public school student. And 74206-1F, to communicate with legal counsel for the public agency to discuss the legal ramifications of and legal options for pending litigation or controversies not yet being litigated 
imminently likely to be litigated. The mere presence of legal counsel at the executive session does not satisfy this requirement. Don Hall. Could you repeat that one more? <laughs> so moved. Second. A motion by Don Hall, seconded by, hold on, I gotta get to the right page to write things on here. Seconded by Greg Lanting to adjourn into executive session for those various items. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Chair and roll call vote, please. Ruth Pierce. Yes. Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Sean Berriger. Yes. Chris Talkington. Yes. Greg Lanting. Yes. Don Hall. Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. I will note that the council will not be making any decisions on these items, nor will we be coming back into uh, the session following the executive session. And with that, we will adjourn. <laughs>